bring in former U.S. attorney, MSNBC legal analyst Joyce Vance, New York Times columnist David French, MSNBC legal analyst Charles Coleman, and the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation, president of the National Action Network, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Good morning to you both. Um, Charles, I'll begin with you here on set with us. Um, your reaction to what we learned yesterday, once that indictment was unsealed, the 34 counts, and how strong this case you think is against the former president? Well, initially, Willie, when I read the indictment and the statement of facts, quite honestly, I was a bit underwhelmed when I started. And I think that many people like myself were looking for that second crime that we had all been waiting to see. How does Alvin Bragg get from the misdemeanor to the felony? As I paid more attention and listened to Alvin Bragg during his presser, it became more obvious. What he is doing is he is using New York State election law, which is a misdemeanor, to get to the felony as his hook. I thought it was an unusual usual way of approaching it. But here's the thing that we have to understand. Alvin Bragg is the Manhattan district attorney, which means that he is the head law enforcement officer in Manhattan in the state of New York. Donald Trump has broken the law. So regardless of how he gets there, whether it's the most overwhelming case, whether it's the case that sort of is going to be the case of the century, it doesn't have to be in order for Alvin Bragg to do his job, which is what he's doing in this instance. So connect those dots for our audience, Charles, because it's such a, it, I mean, the volume of the indictment first, but then the statement of facts as well. You're trying to sort through it and say, okay, what is the connection between what would be a, a misdemeanor, falsifying business records, sure. and a felony crime? What is that link? So the link is this. In order to establish the felony crime of falsifying business records, the idea is that you are basically creating false business records to conceal another crime. So in this case, what Alvin Bragg is alleging is that the falsified business records of saying, listen, we paid Michael Cohen this as a reimbursement is actually cr covering up hush money payments in this case, one instance being to protect or promote an election. And that is one of the payments regarding Stormy Daniels. In respect to some of the other payments, there's also the notion that there were two, not one, but two different shell companies that were created for the purposes of basically hiding this catch and kill scheme that was had with the owner of the National Enquirer. And so that, when it comes to, to those things, what Alvin Bragg is alleging, number one, is potentially there's a covering around tax fraud and a covering around uh, the campaign laws in New York State. Reverend Shopton, you know Alvin Bragg. Give us a sense of the weight that he is carrying, the weight that carried him to yesterday, the charges that were filed. He's lived with this for quite a while. He acted on it. What's going through his mind today? Alvin Bragg is, is probably one of the most methodical people I've met in, in public life. Very cautious, very careful, but very determined to do what is right. And uh, uh, I think people forget just a year ago he was being lambasted for not prosecuting Donald Trump. Even some of his friends were saying that he had in many ways uh, not stood up to what they believe he should have done. But he weighed it, he took the hits. Two of his ADAs, sister district attorneys, quit. One wrote a book. He still waited. And he went through the evidence, which is why I felt when he came with the indictment, he must have done it after he was convinced that it would, in fact, uh, be successful. And let's not forget, a grand jury voted on this. Alvin just didn't wake up one morning and say, Let us, let's indict. But the other thing I think that we are missing here, one of the uh, statements that resonated with me, and I'm not a lawyer like Joe, uh, but resonated with me as just someone watching his statement, he said, we've prosecuted many people in this town for falsifying records. It would have been a miscarriage of his office to have gone after people on Wall Street and other places and let Donald Trump get away with it. Well, if we're going to go after him falsifying records, why did he do it? He did it because of the election. So I've got to go to the root of it, which is a felony in terms of the election. He laid it out very logically. And for Donald Trump to be able to show up yesterday with only a little rally, and you know how the rallies I do, maybe 100 people led by George Santos. If there's anybody oh. I would have wanted not to be at a rally for me, it would have been George Santos. And then he gets to Mar-a-Lago and the pillar man is there, not his wife. So you go from George Santos to the pillow, man. Not a great day for you, Donald. 
Well, as George Santos is a former Supreme Court justice, he certainly could weigh in uh, on the matter. Uh, Joyce Vance, we want to get you in on, on this. Um, two, two parts of you. First is your assessment. We just heard Charles. Your assessment of the case, what you saw yesterday um, from the Manhattan District Attorney. And also, could you tell us, talk to us a little bit about the judge, the warnings about some of the posts from Trump, these threats either to him or to the jurors. Do we think we might be a point where a, a gag order could be issued to a presidential candidate? Well, I'll take the second question first, because I think it's an interesting one. Donald Trump is engaging in conduct that, as Joe points out, would have any other defendant in hot water with the court. It's more complicated with Trump. You've got First Amendment issues involved in a presidential candidate, but his conduct is heinous. And we don't have to look very far back, only to late October, to the attack on Paul Pelosi to understand that Trump's words have impact when they land out in his community of supporters. But, you know, there's something interesting going on here, which is that the former president would probably like nothing better than to have a gag order entered against him. Then he can go out on the stump. He can fundraise, telling people it's terrible. This, this judge says, I can't talk with you about the case. So the judge really has a difficult path um, that he's going to have to navigate here in order to protect the case. The whole reason we don't want folks talking out in public is so ultimately there can be a fair trial. And the judge will have this additional burden of making sure that nothing Trump says is dangerous for jurors, for court personnel, for witnesses, and increasingly for the judge's own family who Trump and folks in his camp have attacked. So it's an unusual and a very dangerous in many ways situation. As for the case itself, I think it's strong prosecutorial tradecraft. This is a well-written indictment. As Alvin Bragg has said, these sorts of business records violations are bread and butter for his office. They're located in, in the heart of the nation's financial center. They have a strong interest in protecting the integrity of business records. And this is really a case about an election. This is the origin story of Donald Trump's efforts to manipulate yes. elections. Because what he's doing here is he's trying, in the wake of the release of the Access Hollywood tape, to prevent additional stories about his unsavory personal life mm -hmm. from coming in front mm -hmm. of voters at this critical point in time. The reason I say this, the tradecraft is, is strong is this, um, just sort of in summary form, the important issue here is whether these charges are misdemeanors or felonies. The business records, the false business records violations are misdemeanors. They become felonies if they're committed uh, in order to aid or to conceal another crime. And so, as Charles says, we've all been speculating, what's the other crime? Prosecutors in Manhattan will give the jury three choices. There are two election violations. There is one tax violation. I think the tax violation may be the sweet spot. A lot of legal wrangling ahead about the election violations, but at least one of them is likely to survive. It can't be true that Trump is immune from both federal and state election law when the state of New York prosecutes him. I think the right. prosecutors have done a very fine job here.